great teacher once told me, if you're not controversial, you're not much. Would you agree? I want to take you back to the last concert I conducted most recently here in Pittsburgh with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. We were presenting Stravinsky's Firebird. Now, this is a beloved work for the audience and the orchestra alike. It's the kind of piece that a conductor dreams of conducting and the players dream of playing. All right, it ends magnificently and huge, okay? And I give the final gesture and the final notes are still echoing and ringing out in the hall and I looked around at the faces of the orchestra members. I saw expressions of horror. I saw shock and disbelief. Their faces said, what have you done to this music? What have you done to this music we love? See, the Firebird we presented that day, it was not the original version. The original version sounds something like this. We are presenting my version, which goes like this. If you're not controversial, you're not much. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm a classically trained musician. At the conservatory, I studied piano, counterpoint, composition, and conducting. When I graduated and entered the real world of classical music, I began conducting orchestras professionally. I was 24 years old, and my dream had come true, and I wasn't feeling it. Okay, I wasn't feeling the buzz. See, by day I was studying classical music, but at night I was studying popular music, playing in bands, producing albums, performing as a singer-songwriter, performing at piano bars. You know that buzz when you go to a small venue and you see a, an up-and-coming band, and you, you're in on something from the beginning, you know they're gonna be huge, and you're in on this secret? Or the electricity when you're at the club and the DJ drops a floor killer and the dance floor erupts. I wasn't feeling that buzz. I would walk out on stage, about to conduct a Tchaikovsky symphony. I look out in the audience, I wouldn't see anyone my age. I would not see my peers. Okay, I didn't think we were about to do something that at that time was culturally relevant. It's not that I didn't love the music. In fact, I loved the music so much it was even more of a tragedy. But I want the buzz that was in the room the first time that Tchaikovsky Symphony was performed, not in the endless thousands of repetitions since. So I decided to do something about it. I made it my mission to bring the buzz to the concert hall. My first attempt towards these ends is the Brahms versus Radiohead, okay? This is a mashup, an orchestral mashup, of the Brahms First Symphony and Radiohead's OK Computer. did create buzz, okay? We had hundreds of new people come to these concerts that would not have normally come to the concert hall. They were coming to hear a reimagined Radiohead, but they were leaving with something in addition. They were leaving with an inclination to go check out this Brahms guy. Okay, that's a big success, <laughs> all right? But it came with negative buzz as well, okay? I had the classical music elite, the purists, the critics, who were saying, who are you to do this? What's wrong with the original? Okay, who are you to do this to Brahms' music? Who are you to deface it with this pop music? Here's The Guardian. We had critics like Tom Service, a very well-known critic of classical music, saying, when you do, 
You can weep at the breathtaking cultural violence done to both OK Computer and to the First Symphony in one of the most remarkably cynically conceived musical projects I think I've ever heard. <laughs> right? So. Okay, and then he goes on to say, the question is why you're doing it. So let me take this opportunity to talk directly to Tom Service. All right, in addition to just wanting to bring the buzz to the concert hall, wanting to create a more relevant contemporary experience around classical music, I'd like to highlight two main things. First of all, this is what artists do. Okay, as creative people, we have all had a unique journey. All right, we've all developed different sensibilities and tastes along the way. It's our job to synthesize them into one for, to create our unique creative voice and then use whatever techniques we've developed and the mediums at our disposal to create something new. That's what artists do. Just take a couple of random examples. Okay, Brahms. He took Hungarian folk music and created for orchestra Hungarian folk dances. He took Haydn's music and composed variations on that music. He took drinking songs and interpolated them into his orchestral overtures. Another example, Radiohead. Before their groundbreaking album Kid A, Johnny Greenwood, their lead guitarist, was studying contemporary 20th century classical music, Messian Paderewski. Tom York was getting into progressive dance music, electronic music. They came together, they synthesized these styles, Kid A as a result. So with Brahms versus Radiohead, that's all I'm doing. I'm taking techniques that I developed on the pop side, a mashup, applying it to the classical medium, and assimilating two types of music that I think should coexist, alternative progressive rock and classical music. Now speaking of two types of music that I think should coexist, this is my second main point here. It's not, they're not as different to me as they are to these other people. Okay, and I certainly would never just say one categorically is better than the other. Okay, that's a, that's a very dangerous line of thinking. I know you'd agree with that. I've studied both kinds of music. I've created both kinds of music. I've learned that the processes that result in the music, they're akin to each other. When you boil them down, they're made of the same 12 notes. This is why I have the keyboard out here today. We're gonna do a little exercise. We're gonna play a little game. I'm gonna play a bare bones segment of music. All right, you're gonna tell me if you think that is pop music or classical music. All right, here's the first. Start with an easy one. Okay, who thinks it's pop? I cannot see anything. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of hands. All right. And who thinks it's classical? Okay, so way more people think this one is pop than classical. Here is the original. Samuel Barber's Violin Concerto. Okay, number two. Who thinks it's pop? Can I see? Uh, okay, and who thinks it's classical? Okay, way more, a lot, lot more hands for classical on this one. All right, here's the original. Yeah, and I heard him say, Nothing's ever promised tomorrow today When a shot like Tim is a hard away So this is in the name of love like robbers say Before you ask me Kanye West By the way, Kanye, if you're, if you're watching, shout me out. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and the final one. Pop. Okay, like nobody. Well, some. Okay. And classical. Okay, more for classical. Way more. Way more for classical. And the original. Oh, I know I'll never lose affection. That's right, it's the Beatles. Okay, so they're not as far apart as we think they are. 
Now with that example in mind, or with these examples in mind, I want to illustrate the moment, my, my kind of light bulb moment with the Brahms Radiohead, where I realized that they had used an identical musical device. All right, this is the very beautiful um, closing moment of the second symphony, uh, the second movement of the Brahms Symphony. So if I play that on the piano, it sounds like... Okay, so the, 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 that final device is this chord going to this chord. And if I start playing around with that and changing the rhythmic figuration, It starts to sound a little like... Radiohead. Okay, let's move on to Beethoven. We've hit Brahms, Beethoven, we're gonna do the three Bs. Beethoven, Brahms, and... Beyonce, yeah, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Bach. Okay. So Beethoven's Third Symphony, the Eroica Symphony, one of the most important pieces of classical music ever written. I'll never forget hearing it the first time, studying it ever since, really worshiping it ever since, and dreaming of conducting it one day. So two years ago, I combined it with Coldplay. <laughs> no! So this was my next project following the Brahms Radiohead. And with this one, I really wanted to try to push the idea of the mashup even further and see if I could really synthesize these two so that they'd be coexisting for much of the time. All right, almost like creating an oratorio out of Beethoven's symphony using the lyrics and the melodies of Coldplay. This meant I was gonna have to alter each and then they would kind of meet in the middle. I was gonna have to change the meter of the Coldplay songs, change the key and change the melody around, and then change the, the music of Beethoven underneath. Okay, I would have to alter Beethoven. Let me repeat that. I would have to alter Beethoven. The thing is, that instinct that my critics have, that you shouldn't tamper with this music, that it's perfect how it is, I have the very same instinct. I've studied this music, it's just as reverent to me. Okay, but the fact remains, it's inaccessible for so many people these days. So I wanted to push forward and try this. I had to find a way to give myself permission to alter Beethoven's music. The way I found to give myself permission was pretty interesting. I was listening to the music of Coldplay, reading the lyrics, and I started wondering to myself, would Beethoven have appreciated this music? I know that sounds very silly. Would Beethoven have liked Coldplay? But really, I mean, consider this. Beethoven was a genius, the likes of which we've maybe never seen before. Okay, the Eroica Symphony, we now know it changed music forever. But at the time it came out, the critical reception was mixed, okay? It was, people thought it was too much. They thought it was self-indulgent. They thought it was unintelligible, too long, even inappropriate. So here's Beethoven, knowing he's a genius, fighting to be regarded as the, the preeminent genius of his generation, but he hadn't established that yet. And yet the critics were like, eh. You really think Beethoven would not have reacted to the Coldplay line, nobody said it was easy? Running in circles, chasing our tails, coming back as we are. Nobody said it was easy. It's such a shame. 
Okay, another line of Coldplay. Tears stream down your face when you lose something you can't replace. Did Beethoven lose anything he couldn't replace? Okay, by the time he was in his mid-30s, he was deaf. Okay, that one skill in him, in him that should have been perfect stripped from him. Could not hear the music he created, could not hear a shepherd singing, could not hear a friend saying hello. He battled depression, he battled suicide. You really think Beethoven would not have reacted with emotion to this music? See This exercise brought me closer to Beethoven's music than reading any biography ever could. Okay, it had me thinking of him as a colleague and a friend and just a fan of music. It's what eventually gave me the permission to alter his music, to change it, and I wish I could share with him what I did with the Beethoven Coldplay. Now following that, I wrote two more orchestral mashups and tried to keep pushing in this direction. First was Copeland, Bon Iver, and then Bartok and Bjork. After that, I wanted to change things up. See, with these pieces, I was really retaining the classical instrumentation. So whatever the instruments Brahms or Beethoven called for, that's, I was limiting myself to those. I wanted to change this up in order to kind of create a piece that could exist not only in the concert hall, but also in the club. This brings us full circle to the piece I started with, that Stravinsky piece, the, the Firebird. All right, with that, it's, it's not only a mashup, it's a remix, and it's a concept album. I took Stravinsky's music and I wrote my own original concept album, writing the rap over top, the vocals over top, using his music and the story of the Firebird as my inspiration for that album. And then I mashed that album back up into the original Stravinsky, so we go back and forth between the original and this concept album. So at the end, you can really hear him rapping over the Stravinsky, but prior to that, that was music that I had written inspired by the Stravinsky. So this is where I find myself today. I'm inspired by those artists, artists like Kanye West and Radiohead, Debussy and Stravinsky, that with every outing, they, they continue to break creative ground. I'm continuing to try to push in this direction of hybrid music between classical and popular, and I'm trying to bring that buzz back, back into the concert hall. Sometimes it might be too much for the orchestra, sometimes it might be too much for the critics, sometimes it might be too much even for the audience, but I have to be okay with that, because after all, if you're not controversial, you're not much. Thank you.